Good evening and welcome to the Township of Woolwich Council meeting today, November 30th, 2021. Before we begin, I will remind Council that this portion of the meeting is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube. Also tonight, the meeting is being broadcast on Rogers TV. I'll start with a roll call uh, uh, of Council for the benefit of those watching this evening. I'm Mayor Schantz, I'm present and I'm chairing this meeting. Councillor Martin. Present. Councillor McMillan. Present. Councillor Merlihan. Present. Councillor Redekop. Present. And Councillor Schantz. Present. Thank you. I'll start with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, oh, we, I guess I should say, first of all, that we uh, did not have a closed session, so there's nothing coming forward from closed session. And we don't need a resolution to reconvene an open session, therefore. The land on which we meet has been here from time immemorial. People have inhabited Southern Ontario for about 10,000 years, and we acknowledge the Attawadaran, the Anishinaabeg, and the Haudenosaunee people who lived here when the settlers arrived and who share this land with us. May we together learn to care for and respect each other, our flora and fauna, and the land we inhabit together. Today is Giving Tuesday, and uh, I, I was reflecting on the generosity of, of this community and uh, the, the, the way that um, so many people give of their time, their talents and their resources. And so as we take a moment of silence, um, I'll ask you to, uh, to reflect on that as well. Thank you. Are there disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, uh, no items to come forward. We have minutes from uh, council November 9th, from special council November 16th, and from committee of the whole from November 23rd. Are there any comments or concerns, Councillor Schantz? Yeah, I just wanted to point out one thing on November 23rd um, in the uh, council, uh, the uh, other business, um, it refers to red light cameras, and I think it should be speed cameras. Uh, thank you very much, Clerk Smith. Can you correct that? Thanks. Anything else? Can I have a motion to, be, to uh, adopt the minutes as amended then? Moved by Councillor Schantz and seconded by Councillor Martin. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. We have no public meeting and no presentations, but we do have three delegations registered this evening. And uh, before we get into that, I have a, a few instructions to read to you. Please leave your video turned off and your microphone muted until you are called on to speak. Each speaker has a maximum of seven minutes. And uh, I believe we're gonna have a timer up on the screen for you to, uh, to follow so you'll know when your time is running out. Once you are finished, please turn your microphone and camera off again, and you may leave after your delegation, or you can stay in the meeting as long as you keep your camera and microphone turned off. Our first delegate this, e our first delegate this evening is Christine Gross, and she has a resolution request from the residents of Chartwell Elmira Retirement Residence regarding the installation of a crosswalk. And Christine. I see we have a video that you want us to play, but did you want to introduce that first? Sure. Thank you, uh, Mayor Chauncey and uh, Woolwich Councillors. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here and uh, offer you uh, some of the concerns that the residents here at Chartwell, a Meyer retirement residents have on Church Street and Snyder Ave regarding a crosswalk. So what we are asking you for this evening is for an endorsement of the request that the residents have sent on already to the region of Waterloo. We're awaiting a report mid-January and crossing our fingers, our toes and everything else that a crosswalk will go through. So thank you for considering the endorsement of this request this evening. And now we'll roll the video where you can hear the concerns of the residents. 
Hello, I'm Pauline Heal. I live at Chartwell. I've been here for three years. And why I think we need a crosswalk here at the bottom of the road, on the corner, is the fact that it's very dangerous to cross. I was warned about it when I first came here. In fact, my family said, be careful, it's going to be a dangerous crossing. And I used to walk uptown in those days without my walker. And I did try um, crossing there. And yeah, it, w it was dangerous, unless you waited back on the on the sidewalk until nothing was coming, which was time consuming, but all right. Um, but it, it was a, lo a long wait. Uh, I didn't go across to the thrift shop more than once or twice. And then I used the little island that was available. But you still have to wait to, to, to use it. It's kind of a dangerous place to cross when the traffic coming over the hill down quickly and then the long way from the town. Once or twice I've just waited until there was nothing on the road coming north or south, which was a long wait as well. So I, I really think it's, it would be very beneficial and better for our seniors to have some sort of sa safety crossing there for when we wish to use it. My name is Lauren Martin. I have lived in Elmira since 1949. I was a merchant downtown, so I'm quite familiar with what, what's going on out here. It's very dangerous when I come down. Sometimes I just drive up to the main intersection, turn at the traffic light, and come down here to the, to the home. When I go across the street to a hockey game, I do go across the island. I go to the center, then I watch the traffic the other way. Hi, I'm Brenda Bartman. I have lived here at Chartwell for about two and a half, three years. I've actually only crossed the street twice. The first time we did it as a group and it was terrible. Traffic would not even stop for a group to cross. So we had to go in smaller groups, I guess is what I'll say. And the second time I went across myself and I really had to wait. Like the traffic coming down, well, they can't see, I don't think, till they're down over the hill. And it's just not safe. And another observation I had yesterday morning, I had to go to town for an appointment. And we went towards Kildeer. And that's the only crossing guard I seen for school children. And that's not safe. I think there needs to be more. Thank you. My name is Eugene Reed. I'm a retired businessman in town. And, and we've moved into this facility for two months now. And we have a room where we can watch the traffic. We really watch the trucks. There's a hill both ways and, and they come down that hill and they sure aren't going very slow. They come past our place and they start hitting the air brakes sometimes. But uh, people trying to get by, I watched people trying to get across and waited and waited and, and also coming down the other direction. The cars are quite often lined up and they have to take a, a chance to get across and, and, and it is a dangerous intersection. I'm Charlotte Reed. Um also been here since September and our room faces right out on the church street where we can watch all the traffic and hear all the noise and the trucks going by um, and watch the school children some trying to cross the street and having to sort of pick and choose when they can dart between cars. Um, this. Crosswalk is something that should have been 
in the works 20 years ago when Chartwell was built. What more is there to say? <laughs> Hi there, my name is Teresa and I'm a staff here at Chartwell and I come across that rock that part of the road every day to come to work. And you watch for the lights at the top of the hill and you figure if there's headlights at the top of the hill, you should be safe to go. But you can't even get all the way across before they're there. Sometimes they step on and you can hear and see that they stepped on and have more speed. So I really as even a person that can walk well, I can't imagine for our poor residents with walkers how they manage. So I really do feel that a crosswalk would be a good thing to have there. Just, yep, there we go. Did you have any um, anything final to say, Christine? I know the time is up, but I can give you 30 seconds if you want it. No, I think all has been said quite nicely. Thank you, Mayor Shantz. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, so they ha um, the, the residents have a proposed uh, resolution here that the Council of the Township of Woolwich endorse the request from the residents at Chartwell Elmira Retirement Residence for the region of Waterloo to install a crosswalk at the corner of Snyder Avenue and Church Street in Elmira. And uh, that is going to the region because Church Street is of course a regional road. Council, uh, do you wanna take any action on that? Councillor Martin. Well, I'd probably like to know who to contact or who to talk to because we've had this before us for at least 15 years. I know my mother lived there for 10 years and she's been gone for seven. And I know very soon after she was there because she walked a lot, we spoke to the region and I think they said it wasn't warranted or something. So this has been around for a long time. And um, rather than just sending a resolution, we need to Oh, we can, but we need to talk to somebody that that will deal with the situation. I think um, regional staff are are aware of it, and they've um, they the the letter has been forwarded to them, and and they're looking at it. As far as I know, um, I, I believe it's Steve Vanderkeer that that is in in charge of that. Councillor Shantz. Yeah, I think we should try and support as, uh, this uh, any way we can. I agree with Councillor Martin that uh, this has been going on for quite a while. I know uh, Councillor Merlihan has been working with this for quite a while and, and hasn't gotten very far, but I think we should try and uh, get some teeth put into it and see if we can get something done. Okay, so are, are you moving the resolution that, uh, okay. Is there a seconder for that resolution, Councillor Martin? Further discussion? Councillor uh, Merlihan. Uh, thank you, Mayor Shantz. Uh, through you, uh, just general comments. Um, I, uh, I, I kind of, I think we do need to do something uh, stronger than a resolution. Um, and I point to uh, St. Jacob's Farmer's Market as one example of a crosswalk that took uh, uh, former Councillor Bauman uh, 12 years. Uh, and that solved the problem. The crosswalk solved the problem, and it took 12 years of convincing, uh, and it didn't, it didn't involve convincing the staff because they still don't want it, um, but uh, it, it involved uh, convincing the council to, to act on that. Um, and I think we're going to need regional council to, to back us on other crosswalks uh, at the other end of, uh, of Church Street uh, by Bollinger Park, and they've already said they do not want to crosswalk there. Uh, and it, it's not warranted. They've already told me that it's not warranted at uh, Church and Snyder. I've been working on the reconstruction project uh, with the region on that team. And, uh, and as of Friday, they told me that they would be um, evaluating the uh, intersection again for um, uh, sig signals and perhaps lights. 
Um, but so far, all the warrants that they have done um, don't warrant it. Uh, and, and I don't think I don't think there warrants uh, warrant crosswalks anywhere in Woolwich Township. Uh, so this really has to go past staff and it needs to go to regional council and uh, where staff are, 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 you know, more or less told to, to work with uh, Woolwich Township on, on some of these areas that are, are obvious to us because we live here. And uh, from past uh, experience with St. Jacob's, it fixed the problem. And uh, we should be in the business of fixing problems. So this is a problem that I think is fixable. We just need um, the region to work with us. Any other discussion, Councillor McMillan? Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to thank the delegates for coming forward tonight. Um, I, I live downtown and, and have to cross at that cross a lot and I'm able-bodied and I can run and it's not comfortable crossing the street there. Um, and, and like some of the other councillors have alluded to, um, up by Bullender Park is another area where we could use some more pedestrian access and um, and Arthur and Wyatt is another one that I think we need improved pedestrian access. And um, I'm in favor of the, uh, the endorsement. Um, I agree with the other councillors that um, some lobbying to regional council would be appropriate um, or, or going further than an endorsement. Um, and, and I also think that maybe including the Elmira BIA. I know the Elmira BIA is um, eager to get more pedestrian access in our downtown area. So uh, I, I know that the BIA meets, uh, it might be tomorrow. Um, so perhaps we could uh, get this on the agenda for the BIA and, and get them to endorse this as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, Scott, are you gonna be at that meeting, the BIA? Y yes. Okay. I'm just not 100% sure of my calendar if it's tomorrow or if it's a week from tomorrow. Yeah, that's okay. I think if we, if we endorse uh, this resolution as a first step and, and um, see where see what uh, staff come back at, and I, I understand the frustration, Councilor Merlihan, um, but but give them an opportunity. I think their uh, plan was to come back in um, January. Christine, is that yes? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, we can wait and hear what they come back with. And if they uh, decline it, we can take further action. And if they, uh, if they agree to it, then uh, we, can, we can go after some of those other ones. Again, some more. <laughs> um, okay, any other discussion? All those in favor? And yes, Councillor Schantz and Councillor Martin. Yep, uh, that's carried, thank you. Trying to trick me. <laughs> okay, so, um, so uh, we have passed the resolution to support your letter to regional council and uh, that will go to, uh, to regional council. And uh, we'll hear back in January from staff from the region and uh, see where they're at and um, then we'll we'll take it from there and if you've got uh, anything further to uh, pass on to us uh, just keep us in the loop we'll do and thank you again for your time and thank you for passing that <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you for your delegation and thank you to the residents for uh, for coming forward it's great our second delegate tonight is Darren Erb, and he wants to talk to us on the reconstruction of College Street and Bond Street in Elmira. Mr. Erb, the floor is yours. Except you're muted. Good. Oh, sorry about that. Good now? Yeah. All right. Guys, go ahead anytime. Yep, yeah, just go ahead oh. when you're ready. Okay. All right, so my name is Darren Erb. Um, I'm a resident of College Street, Elmira. Um, I just came on tonight to speak on behalf of many of the residents on College Street, um, just to voice our concerns regarding the current road re reconstruction plan um, that is supposed to begin spring of 22. Um, while we're all like very excited for the new road to finally being reconstructed, 
Um, we do have some concerns regarding the width of the road design um, that has been proposed. Um, so our current street is 14.9 meters wide. The new street being proposed is only nine meters wide due to a 2.2 meter boulevard being added to each side. Um, we are proposing that the new boulevard be reduced to 1.2 meters on each side, which would then allow for an 11 uh, meter wide street. Um, our understanding is that the nine meter wide street design is being proposed that way um, because it's a standard street cross section for new developments in town, um, which is supposed to help with traffic calming is what uh, I think uh, Ryan Tucker had, had told me earlier. Um, so since it's a dead end street, we feel that the traffic calming isn't a big concern. And that possibly with all the kids that are on the street now, weaving the weaving in and out of parked cars could actually be more cause of concern um, than people speeding down the dead end street. Um, a narrower street gets a lot more congested when cars are parked on the street. It also makes it a lot harder for snow plows, garbage trucks, delivery truck, or delivery drivers, um, um, and etc. to uh, turn around on the dead end street. Um, there's also a home daycare on the street with like five to 10 daily pickups and drop offs a day. Um, many residents uh, park on the street during the summer, like a lot of us have boats, campers, etc. that we park in our driveways and then people park in their drive or people yeah, park them in their driveway and then they end up parking on the street. Um, William Street by Riverside School is an example of a well fun functioning street that's 11 meters wide, um, which would allow for parking on both sides and also allows cars to pass by one another down the center of the street. Um, I believe South Street between Arthur and Snyder is another example of a similar street design as well. Um, this isn't necessarily a new topic or, or request that we're making. Um, since 2014, uh, Jim Perrin, a resident on, on College Street and my, my neighbor, has written a few letters to, to previous mayors and, and current council, as well as submitting petitions signed by a bunch of the residents on College Street, just requesting that when the street does finally get reconstructed, that it, that it does stay a little bit wider, like what we're used to. Um, we've waited for this road construction, as you guys probably know, for a while due to the development um, in the apple orchard at the end of the street there that uh, that's been kind of causing the road reconstruction to get pushed off and pushed off um, when it likely should have been done about 10 years ago or so already. 90% um, of the residents, at least on College Street, would prefer if the street did remain a little wider. Um, and I guess we're asking the council consider making this change to the design. Um, to us, College Street's a unique wide and dead end street. Um, we don't want to throw that away uh, by applying a standard road blueprint um, to a 70 year old road without giving it any thought. Um, that's about all I had for today. Okay. Um Thank you for your presentation. Council, do you have any questions for Mr. Erb? Council Merlihan? And thank you, Mayor Sean. Through you to uh, Mr. Erb. Um, thanks for uh, bringing this to our attention. I know I've spoken to Mr. Perrin uh, several times and got his letters uh, the last couple of years. Um, you, you mentioned that you want to keep it a dead end road, uh, but you do realize that that road will be uh, connecting to Union, and there'll be some sort of subdivision, although it's you know in limbo at the at the moment. Um, that uh, that that road college will eventually uh, link to Union, um, and so how would you see a really wide road where you have right now um, link into that new community? Yeah, so I mean, I guess as far as I'm concerned, yes, it could. I realize it could become a through street. Um, obviously, we don't know when that is or who knows, right? Like nothing's passed. And I realize they're going to try and apply again. Um, 
so I mean, I guess the, the new development should be developed the same, that the street stays the same width the whole way through to keep the character of the, the same character of the neighborhood, right? Or be reduced down at the end of the street, I guess. It just seems a bit foolish to us to take a wide street and cram it down like all the new stuff in the like in the new subdivision in town which you see like don't function great like they're packed with cars on either side um and you just you basically have to weave up and down them in and out of traffic because there's so many cars parked i, I definitely agree with that statement <laughs> okay. thank okay. you councillor mcmillan Thank you, Mayor. Through you, um, we deal a lot with complaints about about uh, traffic calming, and for a lot of years, roads were built with the idea that if you had a wider road, there'd be more space to avoid accidents. So they were built wide for safety, and a fifty-kilometer road was built wide enough to handle a higher speed than that to give extra speed to give extra space to avoid collisions. But the opposite happens people end up using the speed that the road is built for. And then we're left in a situation where Councilor Martin always says the only thing that works is speed bumps. And, and it, it's true because the road is built for a higher speed. And I think I, I understand the concern of the, the streets and what they look like in new sections when they're, you know, littered with cars. Uh, but I think a lot of those houses in the new sections are alley parking. They've only got one car. Um, for they've only got parking on their driveway for one car. And I think the driveways on college and the older part have wider driveways, two car garages. There, there's more room for parking on the driveway. So I think we can get that traffic calming with the, with the more narrow street without having that congestion problem that we talk about in the new areas because people have to park their second car on the street because there isn't, isn't room in the driveway or, or in the garage. So I, I'm worried about having a wider road and then having people in here in a few years talking about traffic calming and, and asking for speed bumps. So did you have a question? What do you think of those comments? <laughs> am, I, am I able to respond to that? No, <laughs> I asked for that, didn't I? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, are there any questions, any further, are there any questions for the delegate for Mr. Erb? Am, am I able to respond to that his? No, we're not. We're not okay, we're fair enough. Do it back and forth. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, th I think, um, yeah. But I do have a question for Mr. Poupe if he's on the call. Are you there, Jared? Hi. Can you... Um, can you tell us the status of that project and, and when there'll be time for, or if there'll be time for uh, community feedback? Um, so to you, um, Mayor Schantz, we have had two public engagement processes, uh, one back in November of 2020, and I, I believe uh, Mr. Tucker did update um, the residents uh, just recently this month um, with those plans, the latest plans. Um, so right now staff are contemplating um, a construction time in the spring uh, for both college and Bauman and we'll be uh, presenting a report to council um, next week on December 7th. Okay, and so will you include um, this delegation and uh, there's three pieces of correspondence also supporting uh, the delegation in, in that uh, information package or in, with, with, with the other comments that you've, you've received today? So at this point, staff are, are, are um, uh, continuing on with the, uh, the standard 20 meter cross section, which includes a nine meter wide uh, curb face to curb face roadway. Um, staff um, are also contemplating the extension, as Councillor Merlihan pointed out, through to Union Street and have set that up. And for those reasons is why we're not contemplating a wider road. Um, it's staff's position that the, uh, the wider roads that um, was alluded to on William Street, those are more collector roads. Our typical local cross sections include the nine meter wide face to face. There is room for parking. Um, there is boulevard space as well, uh, of course, for, for parking in, in the apron. Um, so it's staff's, uh, staff's opinion that, um, that this is the appro appropriate cross section for, uh, um, for, for both college and Bauman. 
Okay, and that report is coming next week. The report is specifically to uh, to uh, seek um, uh, approval from council to proceed with the reconstruction. Okay, thank you, Councillor Merlihan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, through you to Mr. Poupe. Um, Jared, I haven't uh, I haven't seen the plans. Uh, I, I think it's been quite a while, uh, the initial ones. Um, but one of Mr. Perrin's concerns uh, that he had brought forward were, were the fact that the boulevards were going to be um, like really large boulevards. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering in the plans, uh, is there an ability to realign where the sidewalks are? I, I believe the sidewalks are all getting redone as well. Um, but would, it, would we be able to realign the sidewalks on the property and maybe have more uh, frontage on the front of the properties, but the sidewalks closer to the road where it would be then a normal looking boulevard rather than a, you know, twice as wide one that, that isn't really standard uh, throughout the, the municipality. Is, is that possible? Um, three mere shots to Councillor Merlihan. So what we're, um, what we're uh, intent on implying or uh, applying to this cross section would be our standard cross section, which would include a boulevard of 2.2 meters in length, the sidewalks, there are sidewalks existing on both sides of college and uh, on one side on the north side of Bauman. So we will be introducing sidewalk on the south side. Um, however, the, the sidewalks are, the road is sort of not situated in the center of the road allowance currently. So there will be some minor adjustment to the back of sidewalks, but we will see on the north side of college, for example, uh, the sidewalk, will, the back of sidewalk will actually shift closer to the roadway. Um, and as part of this process, uh, we are urbanizing the road. So we're introducing curb and gutter that does not exist. Essentially what we have are sidewalk with asphalt uh, boulevards and a, a very wide uh, road allowance. It's incredibly abnormal for uh, any cross section in, in the township. Um, so there are you know, a few pieces uh, involved in this obviously, but in, in, in our assessment of this, um, we don't see uh, a detriment. We see pedestrian safety with the curb installation. We see the appropriate width boulevards in there that would facilitate uh, parking uh, within that apron as well for those people who are concerned about that. Um, and, uh, and a boulevard that is of grass as opposed to asphalt that would be on the, on the township to maintain. Um, so that's what's contemplated. And, and we have no problem sending around um, the latest plans uh, that were sent to the residents as well, if council so wishes to see those now. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested in, uh, in taking another look at those, but I guess we'll be looking at it next week as well. So that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm also wondering if you could speak to uh, some of the residents uh, concerns were about um, uh, some maintenance stuff, uh, snow plowing and things like that. Um, I did have a resident reach out to me this past week uh, in favor of uh, the plan that uh, staff is putting forward. Um, and he uh, talked about um, uh, the snow plows actually, you know, being easier with a smaller road because it would just be make it two passes rather than, I don't know, three or four or whatever it would take to do uh, a wider street. Can, can you speak to some of those comments the residents uh, brought forward? So through you, um, Mayor Shantz, to Councillor Merlihan. Right. I'm going to let you answer, but um, I think for this discussion, we should probably wait for next week until uh, we actually see the report. But go ahead and answer, Councillor Merlihan, Mr. Poupe. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Shantz. Um, the cross section that we're applying again has been vetted through operations. It is the township standard cross section, so there are no operational concerns with this cross section. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay. And so we'll see that report next week and um, Mr. Erb or any other um, residents, if, if you want to make delegations next week, uh, you can do that through the clerk as well. And, and we'll discuss the report that uh, staff are bringing forward then. Okay, thank you. Our next uh, delegate is Kyle McLeod. And he is a proposal for electric vehicle chargers. Mr. McLeod, welcome. Thank you. Just so wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this uh, crucial proposal to council. Um, so my proposal is as follows. To mandate that all new retail and commercial slash business with parking areas intended for public use, multi-unit residential buildings and townhome complexes of six or more units 
include a minimum of two 32 amp or higher level two electric vehicle charging stations for public use. Second, to install a minimum of two 32 amp or higher level two electric vehicle charging stations for public use at township owned properties, specifically with parking areas intended for public use. And three, to mandate that all existing retail and commercial slash business uh, with parking areas intended for public use, multi-unit residential buildings and townhome complexes of six or more units include a minimum of two 32 amp or higher level two electric vehicle charging stations for public use by a date set by council that is reasonable to provide enough time to existing owners to complete such work. This is something that urgently needs to happen immediately. With Canada's new mandate to eliminate the sale of light duty internal combustion vehicles by 2035, that only leaves our township with limited time to ensure our residents and businesses keep up in the new green economy. Currently, we have no public use electric vehicle charging stations in our community, as confirmed by the crowdsource app PlugShare, which allows electric vehicle owners the ability to discover all available and private use chargers around the world. To ensure our economic future, Woolwich Township needs to be assertive in our green initiatives. And by accepting this proposal, it will put our community on the right path. We need our business and developer partners to lead the way. Woolwich Township needs to be bold and be a leader in a sustainable future. Our community can take advantage of the federal zero emission uh, vehicle infrastructure program, which is specifically designed for this exact proposal. This program provides 50% of total project costs up to a maximum of $5,000 per connector. This means that under this proposal, we can rapidly scale our electric vehicle charging infrastructure throughout our community without it being too much of a financial burden for businesses and housing developers. That means up to $10,000 or more, depending on if a business or, or the township decided to exceed the minimum two chargers in this proposal, would be reimbursed. Last Friday, Halifax announced it is committing to an additional public charging infrastructure. They will install 1,000 level two chargers and 100 DC fast chargers by 2030. The city will lead the installation utilizing Natural Resources Canada funding through that program. Now, I obviously understand that Woolwich is nowhere near the same size, both in population and economy, but this does mean that bold action is being taken in other parts of our country. Just this morning, Natural Resources Canada announced that Dufferin County will be installing 44 new EV chargers by using Canada's zero emission vehicle infrastructure program. This is not an unattainable proposal. On the contrary, this will encourage more investment into our community, just like what the LRT did with Kitchener-Waterloo. It started with a bold idea, and we have seen the seeds of that idea blossom into billions of dollars in private investment in that community. By accepting this proposal, Council will be encouraging its current and future residents to make the switch to electric vehicles sooner than the 2035 federal mandate and set up our community for economic prosperity and development. This means that residents who don't own a home and can't install an EV charger will have the infrastructure in place at their apartment, townhomes, or when they run errands throughout our community to support local businesses and support the new green economy. This will also bring money from outside our community through tourism. When we're finally able to have in-person events at the Amira Maple Syrup Festival, Electric vehicle owners will be able to confidently make the trip from other areas of the province to Woolwich, boosting our economy further and supporting our local businesses. This proposal is an investment in our future. We can't let this opportunity pass us by. Thank you. Thank you for your, uh, your presentation, Mr. McLeod. Are there questions? Councillor Schantz and then Redekoff. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you to Mr. McLeod. Um, do you know what the uh, the bylaws or the laws are uh, for parking in a an EV spot if you're not uh, plugged in? Yeah. So there there is. Um, uh, I think it was a new addition to the Highway Traffic Act um, as an offense uh, to park in a space designated for electric vehicle charging. 
um, where there is actually um, a POA that you, you would be ticketed if you did charge in one of these spaces and you weren't charging. So it's not just specifically, you know, hey, I'm an EV owner, I want a, I want a nice cool spot there. It's, it's specifically you have to be charging. So there is already something in place um, through the province uh, for offenses like that. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question, if I may follow up. Um, do you have any idea what it costs to install a, an EV a charging station? Uh, yes, actually, I just uh, finished doing that um, on my home. Fortunately, I, I do own a home and I'm one of those fortunate people who can put in an EV charger. But uh, for example, my my charger was around 600 bucks. And then it's just the installation uh, cost to, to run the line. So the chargers that I'm specifically uh, proposing to council is the least onerous on uh, businesses um, to implement because it's not the 100 DC fast chargers that Halifax is, is mandating. It's a, a much lower amperage of, of just 32 amps. So you, for my proposal, you'd only need an Andy 80 amp circuit to power both of those, um, both of those chargers. So it's, it's very much less onerous and that $5,000 um, or technically $10,000 under this proposal that, that be um, given back to ins installers and businesses is just a huge benefit because um, as an EV owner and, and being part of the community, we seek out businesses um, who do have EV chargers in place. Like I specifically shop at centers that do have charging versus don't. So not only will this uh, zero emission vehicle infrastructure program help with the installation costs, but the additional benefit of more money being brought to brought to that business is, is just it just makes sense. So would these be free charging stations that you're talking about or, or paid per use? Um, so that's that's something up to the, to the business owner. Uh, from my experience over the past several years, uh, the, the free chargers um, do drive more business. Um, for example, Conestoga Mall has has a charger there. They charge a dollar a minute, or sorry, a dollar an hour, because it's really not that expensive to charge an EV. Like, really, it really isn't. So a lot of business owners actually choose to provide um, the energy for free because they know that it's bringing in business into the community and, and money into into their specific business. So um, before I lived in in town here, um, I did have a duplex in, in Kitchener many, many years ago, and I did install an EV charger there. And because I'm also proposing this for uh, residential facilities as well, um, there are charges that you can get that kind of monitor how much energy is used. And then I just build the, um, the residents that use that at the end of the end of the month. So there's, very, there's a bunch of different avenues, um, but I found the most effective one where, where was the free one for businesses and then the paper use for, uh, for residential, but that's up to the individual property owners to decide. Thank you. And I, I have one question, but it might be more for um, uh, staff than, uh, than the delegate. Um, before we go to staff, um, Councilor Redekop, was your yeah. question for the delegate? Yeah, for the delegate. So in your three uh, tiered proposal, how many charging stations would uh, would happen in under this proposal if you we use existing businesses, new businesses, new developments, like 50, 40, like how many do you imagine that this would enable Willis Township to have? Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know exactly what the, um, what the specifics are in terms of how many businesses follow or fall under in our community. Um, spaces with, with public access parking. So I, I modified this proposal to be at least onerous, but also to be as bold as possible, if that, that makes any sense. So for businesses that are downtown, um, obviously they rely on township owned and, and regional owned uh, parking spaces. So that's too onerous for, for a downtown business. But for example, the new development that's happening, I think it's called Skyline um, development or that, that new complex um, where the Tim Hortons is and, and the new Burger King is, you know, those new, new buildings, those, those new companies, they should um, be putting in EV chargers to, just to support the, the environment, but also to, to drive more, um, more economic success, success into our community. Likewise, in the new developments that were, you know, 
hopefully building less uh, single family homes and, and some more multi-residential uh, buildings to bring more people in who can afford to live in Elmira, that gives them the opportunity as well to, to buy an electric vehicle. Because eventually in the next 14 years, less than 14 years, they won't be able to buy in a gas car anymore. So we're going to have to do this eventually, but if we want to be successful and, and to bring more people into our community, we need to do this now before they come, before it's mandated um, through the federal government. We want people to invest in our community, to live in, in our community and grow businesses in our community. We need to do this now. And as I pointed out in my presentation, other regions have already figured this out um, and are already acting on it now. And this money through the zero emissions um, infrastructure program is it, not going to be around forever. So we might as well take away or take advantage of this hundreds of millions of dollars that's available to us today um, to set us up for that economic prosperity in the future. So as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm more focused on our economy than, than uh, environment. Obviously, I'm, I'm very focused on the environment. This, this is the economy here. We're talking about our local economy. Thank you very much. No problem. Are there any other questions for Mr. McLeod? Councilor Merlihan? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Sean, through you uh, to the delegation. Um, I was uh, I was interested in uh, your, uh, I guess it's a pretty bold proposal. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I kind of look back and go, well, when cars started, you know, they needed fuel. Um, you know, we have gas stations and private enterprise that uh, provided those uh, resources and, and um, the infrastructure was put in place uh, to, to support that. Uh, in this case, you know, you have uh, EV um, uh, machines there that uh, you got lots of car companies now that are phasing out uh, fossil fuels and EVs are going to be the uh, way of the future. Um, I would I would think it would be in their best interest to uh, to have that infrastructure in place if they want to sell vehicles to uh, to uh, make sure that uh, people can um, uh, charge them up and uh, and and that private enterprise would see that as a uh, a business opportunity um, like a shell or whatever that wants to uh, re outfit uh, their properties uh, for uh, the future. Um, so, so there would be that question I, I would, I would pose to you. Um, but also, you know, how many people have a first generation iPod? Uh, I probably have four of them around here that, you know, they don't work very well because the, they changed the adapters on them and, and now they're basically bricks. Um, do we really want to put in a proposal where we're mandating the technology right now as it is, uh, on these businesses when, you know, between Ford or Kia or Toyota, I don't know what they're charging, if, if there's anything standard. I know there's no standards uh, when it comes to uh, electronics. Uh, so we could put in a whole lot of, uh, of, of these stations that would be outdated in, you know, five years. Um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering if those are some considerations that, uh, that you thought of and, and uh, how you would respond to, to, to that. And then I would have one other comment, but I'll let you respond to those two. Go ahead, Mr. McLeod. Yeah, so um, to answer your concerns, um, there's, there's a standard in North America called the J7, J1772 standard, standard that every electric vehicle um, plug is exactly the same. So you can go to any station owned by any operator anywhere in North America, and it will have that same, that same standard other than Tesla, um, but Tesla owners have an adapter and it comes with every vehicle. So that's not a concern. Um, so I understand where you're coming from in terms of, you know, jumping on board with first generation, but this standard has actually been around since uh, 2012. And it is the standard going forward. Um, and the reason why I specifically mandated the uh, 32 amp or higher um, uh, energy capacity is to future proof that uh, that system. So uh, at 32 amps, an electric vehicle will charge at 50 kilometers an hour. So even as batteries get bigger, it's still very much future proof. And it is kind of the standard of, of 
what I'm classified or what is classified as a level two charger. So um, to answer, answer that concern, it's, it, it, it already is a standard. It's been mandated by every automaker um, and every provider that it will be that standard. Um, additionally, since I'm not talking about DC fast chargers, um, private enterprise doesn't um, care as much because they, they private enterprise such as Petro Canada, which has a nationwide um, charging infrastructure, they do operate um, as a for-profit uh, system, but they're only doing it at, at their, their level, what's classified as level three fast charging. And um, that, that varies wildly. So what I'm proposing for the level two is, has been around for almost a decade and will continue to be around um, till the end. It, it's a very, very uh, future-proofed uh, connector. So um, in terms of private enterprise, you know, if we're waiting for private enterprise to, um, uh, to do the investment, first off, they're not going to for um, level two community charging. And that also doesn't address um, the number one concern that when I speak to my coworkers and, and people in the public about electric vehicles, the number one concern isn't so much the cost of the electric vehicle. It's, I have no place to charge it. I live in an apartment. I live in a condo. I don't own a home. I want an electric vehicle vehicle and again it will be forced upon us very very soon um so whether we like it or not but uh, where am i going to charge it so this is going to set up our community for any future development and anybody who owns um, a, a multi-residential residential unit of six or more units now residents can start thinking okay i can still live in this community because I'm going to need to travel because we're a sleeper community. So I'm going to go work in, in Kitchener or Waterloo or Cambridge or whatever, but I want to stay here. I want my money to stay here. This is how we do it is by having these building codes or, or this mandate set out. So it means people can live, continue to live here and continue to grow our community rather than seeing the opposite happen. Okay. Thanks. Um, and I guess just a, just a comment uh, from me kind of on, on this subject, and I don't want you to get me wrong. I, uh, you know, all four, uh, charging stations and, uh, electric vehicles. And, you know, I believe that climate change is, is an issue and an emergency and we need to act on it. Um, however, in, in, in this case, uh, electric vehicles are still a very privileged, um, uh, item to own. And it's, it's, it's not something available for everyone. And uh, I would really be concerned about us mandating um, businesses. Uh, and uh, I, I would be for, as a municipality, we, you know, what we should be doing is making sure that the, uh, the wire, the proper wiring is there at the curbside when we do a reconstruction of, let's say, downtown Elmira in a couple of years that we make sure that the wiring is there for future use, uh, whatever that is, and, and, uh, and, and have those available when, when we do that. But uh, as far as band-aiding um, at this point, when electric vehicles are just for the privileged, uh, I, I, I would have a, a bit of a concern on that, but I certainly would encourage uh, businesses to, uh, uh, to, to, to make that investment if, if they're talking to their customers and, uh, and, and want to entice that. Um, I just don't see as a, as a municipality um, uh, mandating it right at this point, um, but we'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Mr. McLeod? Okay, um, thank you for your presentation. I think we have some questions for staff and then um, we'll see if, if there's any appetite to um, actually um, make a, a, a resolution at this point from council. Ms. Fries, um, Councillor Schantz, you had some questions for staff. Yes, uh, thank you. I don't know if this is for Ms. Fries or uh, for uh, Thomas, but I know we were planning on putting uh, EV stations at the uh, Woolwich Memorial Centre and also in St. Jacobs at one point, and uh, the $10,000 seems like that's a reasonable cost, but uh, we ran into some other costs that, uh, that this delegate hasn't uh, spoke about. So maybe they can fill us in on the, on the cost that we were looking at compared to the, the $600 that he was talking about. Thomas? Oh, I can't hear you. 
I don't see your mute button on, but I can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, there we go. Um, through you, Mayor Shantz, to Councillor Shantz. Um, yeah, just touching on the project that we had uh, had proposed for 2021, we had we did receive 20,000 in funding from NRCAN, um, which is the the same area that our delegate is speaking of. Uh, when we, we we received an original cost estimate for a dual commercial dual charging station, one at the Walsh Memorial Center and one at St. Jacobs and the public lot on Water Street. And uh, original estimates came back at 70,000 for the, both of those installs. And then once we tendered that project and received bids, uh, the Woolwich Memorial Center was $80,000 and St. Jacob's public parking lot was $85,000. Now, what drove those costs um, was engineering, was the construction as well as miscellaneous items such as signage, that sort of thing. Um, it is extremely cost effective to install this type of infrastructure for charging stations when we're redoing parking lots, when we're doing road recons, that sort of thing. If we need to retrofit, um, you know, so St. Jacob's uh, public parking lot, for example, we were required to pull hydro from the second floor of the fire station and run it 100 meters across, you know, on the boulevard to, to where the proposed location was. So we are, you know, moving forward, us as a department, RCS, we, when we are doing, when we are doing repaving projects of our parking lots, we are looking at at least getting infrastructure in place. However, having said that, um, you know, speaking to the second proposal that our, that our delegate has put before you, Council, um, not necessarily all parking lots, you know, strategic locations, destination sites. So we are looking at uh, eventually St. Jacob's public parking lot the Woolwich Memorial Center, and then public parking in Elmira as well. Thank you. Do you have, are there other questions for staff? No? Okay, Ms. Priest, did you have something to add? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, to follow up on the first part of the request, and this is actually something that we will be looking through, uh, looking at through our uh, zoning bylaw update that we're undertaking now, um, hoping to have that done mid next year. Uh, I did look at the standards in the city of Kitchener and the city of Waterloo, and both of them do have standards for um, a certain number of uh, electric vehicle ready spaces. So in Waterloo, they have about three to 5% of the required parking spaces that have to be EV ready. So they've designed and constructed that they're EV ready. And in Kitchener, they have 20% of parking spaces for multiple dwellings and 15% of non-residential parking spaces to be designated in EV ready and 5% only to actually, actually be equipped for EV supply. Um, equipment right now. So that's just what Kitchener and Waterloo have done in their zoning bylaw. And we will be looking at some types of standards in um, or some types of regulations in the Township of Woolwich bylaw, um, but not quite as specific with the um, the AMPs and, and so on, but it'll be more of a, a vehicle ready um, policy or regulation as well, similar to what Kitchener and Waterloo I would expect, but we'll have to take a look further into that when we do our zoning bylaw review. Also, I did wanna mention that we have had some discussions with private um, developers as well about uh, put installing these as well in their new developments. So this is all for new developments though not existing. Thank you for that, Councillor Shantz. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, just to follow up on that uh, comment. So how, how does this work uh, when we have to have a certain number of parking spots at a location and all of a sudden we start putting EV parking spots in and uh, people can't park there? So how, how does that work for, uh, for those numbers? So if we are putting regulations in that the, the spaces have to be EV ready or EV designed and constructed, then they wouldn't actually be designated for the electric vehicles at this time. There would be no enforcement. If there are actual um, installed spaces that are designated for electric vehicles, then it would be a parking enforcement matter if somebody were to park in those spaces. So that's why we have to be cautious with the number of required um, spaces and how that that uh, impacts the development as well. If we if we take away some of the required parking spaces and make them electric vehicle parking spaces. 
Thank you. That was that was my question. And the uh, second question I have is you talk about EV ready. So I'm assuming that's conduit in the ground ready to pull cabling in if we if and when we need it. And uh, and that's that's the only expense they would have at the beginning. Yeah, and this could be done during the construction of the new buildings. Thank you, Councillor um, Martin, and then Councillor Merlin. Thank you. Um, just a comment, I was told on the weekend that it will be in the building code, if it isn't already, very shortly, that any new resident that's built will have to have a hookup for an electric vehicle. Secondly, um, with what I've read, a Ford 150 will go 700 kilometers pulling a trailer without a charge. I don't know too many people that drive 700 kilometers a day. So if you have an electric vehicle, have a charging system at home, you should be able to charge it and go anywhere you want the next day. As long as you're not on a road trip. Councillor Merlihan. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Mayor Schantz, to uh, Ms. Freeze. Um, I'm just wondering if you could clarify, uh, you, you spoke about um, City of Waterloo and City Kit uh, Kitchener in the, the zoning aspect, um, and you're talking about only new builds, and would that be for businesses as well then? Like, it, there wouldn't, they don't have anything mandating um, other businesses to come into compliance uh, that are already there. It's only for uh, new uh, construction that they would be required to have these new EV uh, ready uh, spaces? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, yes. So these would be for any new developments, this regulation would be imposed. If we put the regulation in the bylaw, there's two ways you can do it. One is you can apply it only to developments after the date of, uh, of acceptance of the bylaw, so 2021, 2022, or two, you can just put it blanket right across the board to require them. That would mean that any property that did not have that regulation met would be legal non-conforming. So there's two ways we could do it. Yeah, okay. And um, would you say kind of by mid next uh, 2022 that we'll be looking at this again um, at a council meeting and, and have what kind of impacts that will be and all that kind of information for, uh, for people? Yeah, through you, uh, Madam Mayor, um, this will be as part of a zoning bylaw update, so it will include other updates in the zoning bylaw as well, and yes, we are expecting that uh, we'll be able to go for a public meeting um, early 2022 and then actually come back with the amendment mid-2022. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any. Um, Mr. McLeod was asking us for a resolution, but I think what I'm hearing from staff is that uh, early in 2022, we're going to um, have a public meeting to talk about our zoning bylaws. And I think that would be maybe a more appropriate time that we can have further discussion here, but I'm in your hands, council. Councillor Schantz? I would agree with you. I think it should be deferred until we get a, pro, a full report. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Or, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your delegation, Mr. McLeod. And this is an important uh, topic, an important issue that obviously um, staff have, have given some consideration to and, and council has. And uh, I would say, uh, based on the comments, that uh, 2022 will be excuse me, a year when we, we look at it um, more seriously. So um, you can watch for those meetings and certainly delegate again if you so wish, or um, for sure listen in and see where it's going. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have no unfinished business. We have a few consent items. Um, you want to take a look at those, we can uh, approve them and receive them for information. We have recommendations from the November 2nd Committee of the Whole meeting. We have uh, no correspondence and we have a notice of a Committee of Adjustment and notice of hearing on December 13th. So would someone like to move the consent agenda? Councillor McMillan, seconded by Councillor Redekop. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. 
We have uh, two staff reports and I will call on Mr. Smith, Director of Corporate Services to uh, speak to the first, actually speak to both of them. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just really quickly, uh, we clarified at the last company meeting uh, that the updated 2019 schedule would have uh, second quarter of 2 meeting presentation. Thank you. Sorry, uh, my microphone wasn't on. Um, so through you, Madam Mayor, uh, we clarified at the last meeting that uh, when the 2022 council meeting schedule has two days on the same week, the second day would be Thursday. So I've included that for your reference there. And then we also looked into publishing agendas on Tuesdays as, as council asked, uh, but with all the preparation that comes before a meeting, the earliest we I think we can really publish on is 1 p.m. on Wednesdays. So uh, the, the memo sort of talks about the timelines that would flow from that, but that is um, uh, a longer publishing period than we had originally proposed. Uh, and then we drafted a bylaw by that would bring all those changes um, into effect uh, for you to consider tonight. So uh, no, uh, no recommendation here, uh, unless any council has any questions. Uh, we just be wanted to provide this context for you before uh, you consider the bylaw uh, later uh, in, at the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Smith? Okay. Seeing none, then um, I guess carry on with the, with your work on that. And uh, the next uh, item is yours as well. Uh, thank you again uh, through you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to introduce a request from the Kiwanis Club of Elmira uh, for waiver of the road closure fee. Um, the uh, Kiwanis Club is um, organizing their traditional Santa Claus parade, uh, which will be this, uh, sorry, next, sorry, this Saturday, this Saturday. December 4th. Uh, beginning at 10, uh, 10 a.m. Um, and the, uh, the fee for the road closure is a fee of uh, $200. They already have all their uh, necessary approvals in place, but they're asking for waiver of that fee. And then just for council's context, uh, I did want to note that um, uh, the Qantas Club has not yet applied for uh, COVID-19 relief funding. And uh, there is a balance in that account if council wishes to uh, consider that request. Uh, thank you. Okay, so so your suggestion would be we um, use the <clears throat> excuse me the COVID relief funding to to fund the the fee. Uh, so ultimately, the decision would be up to council uh, whether they wish to uh, consider the request or not. Uh, if you do, uh, if you did want to consider the request, I just wanted to point out that that would be where we recommend the funds come from. Okay, thank you. Uh, and do you need a uh, motion for that? Uh, if you wish to take any action, a motion would be required, yes. Okay, thank you. Council? Councillor Schantz? Is that a fee that a uh, uh, township or is a regional fee? Mr. Smith? Uh, through you, Mayor Schantz, yes, that's a township fee. Uh, Schantz. I'll, I'll move that we support it. Okay, is there a seconder, Councillor Merlihan? Um, questions, comments, Councillor McMillan? So are we paying the fee out of the COVID? Is that what the motion was? I think that was the recommendation, Councillor Shantz, was that your intent? And Councillor Merlihan? Yeah. Okay, uh, all those in favor? And that's carried, thank you. Other business, uh, regional matters. Um, a lot of our work is, is budget work these days. We're meeting um, several times for, uh, for various budget uh, matters. Are there any um, council reports or updates? Councilor Merlihan? Sorry, through you, uh, back at you um, on the regional stuff. I'm wondering if... Uh, you could give an update on the uh, the police uh, department uh, leaving Elmira. I, I had a couple of calls this week about that. Yeah, sure. Thank you for, uh, for that reminder, Councillor Merlihan. Um, the the uh, Waterloo Region Police are are doing a little bit of restructuring in how they um, organize their their units, and um, the the rural uh, branch, the rural unit, will be. Um, 
deployed out of the Waterloo um, building. Um, currently, uh, the, the unit that was here um, was not, or, or the office actually was not open all the time uh, anyway. Um, and uh, the uh, connections with, with their uh, supervisors is uh, more complete at the, the Waterloo uh, site. Um, but what I, what I have been assured is that um, there will be just as much uh, police presence in, in the rural areas. And um, the, um, the, there's also a community uh, policing unit that is, is being, uh, has been developed and, and is uh, working to make connections in communities, uh, not just in the rural areas, but, but in all different communities. But we will, and um, they will work closely with, with the uh, rural division um, to provide service to, to the townships. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask for um, a presentation in the new year to uh, come to council and, and sort of explain how some of these new, um, new policing um, units will work together and, uh, and support the, the townships. Thank you. Any other, any council reports, updates, other questions that I may or may not be able to answer? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, anything on the outstanding activity list? Okay, nothing on that. There's no notice of motion. I need a, a motion that the following bylaws in the hands of the clerk be read a first, second, third time and finally passed and that they be numbered as bylaw number 65, 2021 to 72, 2021 and that they be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with a corporate seal. Um, I'm not sure if you need me to read them all. Um, do you want me to read them all? No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Redekop. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. And that uh, brings us to the end of our agenda this evening. Um, I need a motion to adjourn to meet again in regular session on Tuesday, December 14th. <coughs> Moved by Councillor McMillan, seconded by Councillor Merlihan. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. And in closing, uh, Council would like to thank all who are participated or tuned in to the meeting tonight, to our YouTube live stream and on Rogers TV. Council, please stay connected on Zoom until we receive confirmation that the live stream has stopped. And good night to everyone. <laughs>